When I tell you to imagine the face of evil, you probably think of someone like Hitler or Ted Bundy or Dream. Admit it, you were thinking of Dream. Look into this man's eyes and tell me he doesn't have bodies buried under his house. To millions of people in Central Africa, if you ask them to imagine the face of evil, it would be this. This man, Joseph Kony, has committed every atrocity you can think of, from kidnapping to murder to cannibalism, slavery, the list goes on. Prior to March 5th, 2012, nobody outside of Uganda had any idea who Joseph Kony was. But all of that would change with this video. Kony has been kidnapping children into his rebel group, the LRA, turning the girls into sex slaves and the boys into child soldiers. And this is not just a few children. It's been over 30,000 of them. He takes children from their parents and he gives them a gun and he makes them shoot and kill other people. My brother tried to escape. Then they kill using panga. They cut his neck. It's hard to look back on some parts of human history. Too often, we did nothing. But if we're going to change that, we have to start somewhere. So we're starting here with Joseph Kony. At the time, this was the most viral video ever made, and its objective was clear. Stop the rebel group, the LRA, and their leader, Joseph Kony. Unfortunately, this story does not have a happy ending. Not only did the video fail to stop Kony, but it also ruined the life of its creator, Jason Russell. This is the story of Kony 2012. This video was sponsored by Aura. Now, just a little disclaimer, this video is gonna contain some very disturbing content, but not as disturbing as the fact that data brokers are stealing your information and selling it online. In fact, it's probably happening right now. That's right, your name, email, address, feet pics, health records, your relatives, it's all probably out there being sold on the dark web. That's why you get so many spam calls and emails. Isn't that shocking and or alarming? Luckily, Aura can help you see which data brokers have your info and send them requests to opt out. This protects you not only from spam, but also from scumbags who might use your information for nefarious purposes. Oh, and I almost forgot, Aura also offers an antivirus, VPN, password manager, and more all-in-one, simple, and easy-to-use app. God damn, that deal's hotter than a $2 pistol. Go to Aura.com slash Dantavius today for a two-week free trial. And thank you to Aura for sponsoring this video. Okay, so I think most of us know the basics of Kony 2012. Joseph was this big, bad African warlord with an army of child soldiers. But where did he come from and what the shit was going on in Uganda that made it possible for a man like this to exist in the first place? I've seen a lot of videos about Kony 2012, but none of them really went in depth on the man himself, which is a shame because this dude was not only evil, but he was also a self-proclaimed messiah who could speak to the dead. Like, this dude was psychotic in multiple ways. So if you guys don't mind, I'm going to take some time to talk about the history of Uganda and the events that paved the way for him to take power. If you're not interested in that, you can skip to this timestamp in the video, but I highly recommend you watch the whole thing because I make more money that way. Let's start at the beginning. Four billion years ago, the earth entered a cooling period and the oceans began to wait. That, that's too far. Let's uh, fast forward this a little bit. The land that we now call Uganda was discovered by the British in the 19th century when they set out to find the source of the Nile River. Back then in that part of Africa, they didn't really have a concept of nation states. So it was a bunch of these tribal kingdoms with different ethnic, cultural, and religious backgrounds. So the British did what they do and combined all of these groups together into one nation. It's much easier to rule a country when everyone in it hates each other. And just to add even more racial tensions, they also imported a few thousand Indians and gave them complete control of Uganda's commercial sector. Basically, the British created a giant bowl of shit soup that would continue to simmer until it reached a boiling point. Skip to 1962, Uganda gains its independence. They held their very first elections and Milton Obote became the first prime minister. Woo, democracy! 
Two years later, he suspended the constitution, imprisoned or exiled his political rivals, and abolished Uganda's traditional kingdoms. Now, because of all those pesky ethnic tensions we talked about, Obote had a lot of enemies, but one guy he could always count on was his best friend and highest ranking general, Idi Amin. And if you know anything about him, you know where this is going. On January 25th, 1971, Amin, with help from Israel, weirdly enough, took control of the government via a military coup while Obote was away in Singapore. God damn, man, this is like top 10 anime betrayals of all time. This is worse than when my girlfriend slept with my Uncle Ruben. Now, if you don't know, Idi Amin is probably like one of the top 10 schmucks of all time. You don't get a nickname like the Butcher of Uganda, aka Black Hitler, for no reason. During his eight years in power, Amin was responsible for 300,000 deaths and the expulsion of Uganda's entire Indian population. He was also rumored to eat human flesh and keep the severed heads of his enemies in a freezer. So uh, yeah, not a very cool dude. I know I was talking about how bad Kony was, but like the guys leading up to him are probably even worse, to be honest. In 1979, Amin tried to invade neighboring Tanzania and got his ass handed to him. So he was forced to flee to Saudi Arabia where he died in exile. Obote then returned to power, but that would only last for a few years before this guy, Yaweri Moseveni, took power in 1986. And this is where our story truly begins. This Museveni guy, like his predecessors, was a big putz, especially to the Acholi people of the north. I'm telling you, this man was absolutely brutal. He was burning down villages, mass murdering civilians, and he even had concentration camps with millions of Acholis in them, which probably explains why Serbia gave him a medal, but that's neither here nor there. The thing is though, the Acholis didn't just sit down and take it, they fought back, and multiple rebel groups formed and declared war on Museveni. Most of them got put down quickly, except for one called the Holy Spirit Movement, led by this lady, Alice Laquena, a self-proclaimed prophet who claimed that she could communicate with spirits. Now, I bring her up because one of her top generals was her cousin, Joseph Coney, but we'll get to him in a little bit. I gotta tell you about Alice first. And it hurts me to say this, because I'm a feminist, but this bitch was crazy. She essentially started her own religion, which was like a weird mix of Christianity, African spiritualism, and mental illness. According to Alice, she could not only communicate with spirits, but she would also get possessed by them sometimes. Oh, and God chose her to purify Uganda. If that isn't wild enough on its own, let me tell you this woman's military strategy, okay? L listen to this shit. First of all, you were not allowed to join her army if you had more or less than two testicles. So I wouldn't have made the cut. She also advised her soldiers to never take cover and sprint directly towards the enemy, which on the surface sounds like an incredibly stupid idea, but it's okay, because she would rub the soldiers down with this special oil that would make them immune to bullets. Okay, let me say that one more time. She coated them in an oil that made them immune to bullets. She also claimed that she could turn stones into exploding grenades by blessing them. This all sounds ridiculous, but I, it must have worked because she actually won a few victories against Museveni. But her success went to her head because one day she decided to make the extremely bold move of marching on the Ugandan capital of Kampala, where her army was immediately obliterated. I guess they must have ran out of the bulletproof oil and rock grenades. After this, Alice fled to Kenya where she would live the rest of her life as a refugee. But she inspired others to take up arms against Museveni, including her cousin, Joe Kony. After Alice's fat defeat, Kony regrouped the surviving soldiers and formed his own rebel group, the Lord's Resistance Army. And he would adopt a lot of the same weird ass beliefs as Alice, like the whole talking to spirits shtick. How many spirits speak to you? Very many. I don't know the number, uh, but they speak to me, they talk to me. With the aid of spirit, they will tell to us, you, Mr. Joseph, go and take this, this thing and that thing. According to Kony, he would be possessed by a number of different spirits, including, and I am not making this up, a Chinese one named Hing Su, who would give him advice on how to beat his enemies. Kony would dress in a white robe, and a glass of water, a Bible, and a rosary were placed on the table. 
To start the possession, Kony would dip his fingers into the clear glass of water. Multiple spirits would then pass through him in a single session. On average, at least three spirits would talk in one session. Each spirit had a separate personality and he would change the tone of his voice depending on which one was talking. For example, if the spirit was a woman, he would uh, change to a more feminine tone. His followers did not dare to question him or the spirits. The LRA was less of a rebel army and more like a militarized cult with Kony serving as the charismatic religious leader. His soldiers believed he was like this messiah figure who could not be killed. Is Joseph Kony a god? Is he a god? Not god. Not god. But he have a spirit. How, how many spirits does he have? Ah, uh, three. Three spirits? Yes. He's, he's like a prophet. He can see it. He can see things before they happen. Yes, 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 yes. And and are you suggesting that the spirit enters inside him and gives him knowledge? Yeah. yeah. I like it. Yeah. He cannot be killed. Yes. I'm sure that. I'm sure. He can be killed. It's impossible to kill Joseph Kony. Yeah. Even if I shot him here, would be right in the chest. Yeah. Would he die? No. 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 He cannot die. No. But all this begs the question. What did this guy want? What were his goals? Well, according to him, he was just a simple freedom fighter trying to liberate Uganda from the tyranny of Museveni. Kony's ultimate goal was to establish a theocratic system of government based on the Ten Commandments, which is very ironic because he routinely broke every single one of those commandments. Thou shalt not murder. I mean, this one is pretty obvious. He literally killed thousands of people. And if you were lucky enough to survive, there's a good chance you could get mutilated. He would cut off innocent civilians' noses, lips, and hands. And sometimes he would even force his soldiers to eat people. Okay, remember, these are children. Thou shalt not steal. One of the things he was most famous for, as we know, is stealing children from their parents. Not only to use as child soldiers, but also to serve as his brides and sex slaves for him and his generals. This man had 60 wives and fathered almost as many children as Nick Cannon. He's literally like the African Genghis Khan. It should be mentioned that the LRA drew the line at making boys into sex slaves, cause you know, say what you want about the guy. He's a mass murdering lunatic with no soul, but at least he's not gay. Honor thy mother and father. So this is one of the worst things I've ever heard. Kony would make children murder their own parents. That way they would be completely dependent on him in the LRA for survival. And it, it hardened them, you know, because the logic is you've already killed your own parents. What's a few strangers? Thou shalt not covet. For all his religious posturing and big talk about wanting a free Uganda. At the end of the day, Kony wanted what every megalomaniacal psychopath wanted. How? He wanted to take power away from Museveni. He coveted that sweet, sweet throne, and he was willing to destroy anyone and everyone who stood in his way. Now, I'm not gonna run through all 10 of them, but you get the idea. The guy was the type of evil you don't wanna believe exists, but unfortunately is all too common. When the International Criminal Court was formed, he was the first guy to ever be indicted with 19 counts of crimes against humanity and 17 counts of war crimes. This guy made Serbian militia leaders look like fucking schoolgirls. But of course, if you asked him about that, it was fake, just propaganda drummed up by Museveni to make his righteous movement look bad. You have been accused of um, terrible crimes. You know, people having their ears cut off, people having their lips cut out. That one is not true. That is propaganda which Museveni made. I've seen the photos of people with no Yes, lips. yes, yes. That is propaganda which Museveni made. Let me tell you clear. Uh, that thing was happening in, in Uganda. Museveni he went in the village and he cut the ear of the people, telling to the people that that, that, uh, that, uh, that thing was done by LRA. Which is not true. I cannot cut the ear of my brother. I cannot uh, 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 kill the eye of my brother. I cannot kill my brother. That is not true. I'm not guilty. I'm not guilty. Uh, I'm not guilty. You know, I was pretty certain that this guy was guilty, but now I'm not so sure anymore. By 2003, Kony had kidnapped and enslaved over 20,000 children. And that's not to mention the amount of people who were killed or displaced because of his army. All in an effort to bring freedom and democracy to his homeland. But sadly, people of Uganda just didn't get it. Kony's name alone was enough to strike terror into Uganda's children. He was sort of like a boogeyman. Parents would tell their kids, don't go out past dark or Kony will get you. Except in this case, it was 
all too real. Every night, children from villages all over northern Uganda would leave their homes and go to the city to avoid the LRA's raids. This is the scene that Jason Russell saw when he visited Uganda in 2003. We fear that if we sleep at our home, we can be abducted by the rebels because our home is far away from town. They will catch us, then they will take us there in the bush to come here to save our life. Jason was so moved by what he saw that night that he decided to dedicate his entire life to stopping the LRA by any means necessary. So him and a few buddies got together and started their charity, Invisible Children. Now, I always kind of thought Coney 2012 sort of came out of nowhere. I guess I didn't really think about it. But Jason had spent the better part of a decade before that trying to spread the message about what was going on in Central Africa. In fact, Coney 2012 wasn't even their first documentary or their second. It was their 10th. Before their big break, Invisible Children would travel to high schools and colleges across the country to screen their documentaries, sell merch, and collect donations. And it was going okay. Right, like moderate success, but nothing too crazy. Jason and co. tried a bunch of different tactics to try to drum up more support for their cause, including whatever the hell this was. Let's do what we always do. Dance. Wait, wait, wait. We haven't even gotten to the singing yet. We're on a mission for you, got it deep inside your mind. It needs attention and a dance to make it sparkle and shine. Now, this may seem in bad taste, but you guys got to remember, this was 2006, okay? High School Musical was popping off at the time. Also, there's no denying, it is kind of catchy. Gotta shake it up and break it up. Anyways, nothing could have prepared Jason for how big Coney 2012 was going to be. At first, the video wasn't really getting too much traction. The first day, it only managed to get about 70,000 views. Jason was thinking to himself, fuck. So, but then, just as he was about to reach for the razor blade, Oprah came to the rescue. This tweet changed the entire trajectory of Jason's life. We are so back he thought to himself. When Oprah posted this, the views shot straight into the stratosphere from 66,000 to 9 million overnight. And Oprah wasn't the only celebrity showing support. Kim Kardashian, Bill Clinton, P. Diddy, Bill Gates, basically Epstein's entire address book was tweeting out hashtag stop Coney. Angelina Jolie was so swept up by Coney fever that she offered to act as bait and lure Coney out so that he could be arrested. Okay, this, this was an actual plan cooked up by the International Criminal Court. So here was the plan. Basically, Angelina would invite Coney to a fancy dinner with uh, shrimp cocktails and caviar and all that bullshit, where an elite team of US Special Forces would be hiding. When the time was right, they would jump out of the bushes and arrest Coney. The ICC's chief prosecutor, who was featured in Coney 2012, said in a leaked email, she loves to arrest Coney. She is ready. Probably Brad Pitt will go also. This guy's based as hell, man. But unfortunately, it ended up not working out. But hey, it didn't matter because the video was still doing numbers. In just six days, it reached 100 million views. And you guys got to remember, this was before Mr. Beast was created in a lab. So 100 milli in a week was a record. It was officially the most viral YouTube video of all time. It got so big that even Alex Jones had to weigh in. And we're gonna get cunning, gonna get cunning. And you can tell they're government operatives that got like evil in their eyes, you know, hardcore. I mean, the real spirit is ah, 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 murder us, ah, invasion force, ah, release us. Ah. Funnily enough, he wasn't the only one that had a conspiracy about invisible children. Anonymous also had their own. Anonymous would like to bring to your attention that Joseph Connie has been dead since the year of 2006. The ICC had dropped all charges against him due to the certification of his death. This is complete horseshit, by the way. Coney was, in fact, very much alive. Anyways, when Alex Jones accuses you of being a psyop, you know you've truly made it. And just when things seemed like they couldn't get any better, 
Soldier Boy dropped this banger. Taking kids, turn them into soldier, put a gun in his hand, and his life is over. It's getting so crazy, gotta take it over. We gonna stop Coney, it's 20 over, it's 2012. Oh my stars. That shit is hot trash. Unfortunately, the massive wave of support that Invisible Children received was quickly overshadowed by the tsunami of criticism that followed. And let me tell you, it wasn't just Alex Jones. Critics have questioned the content and credibility of the video, accusing the filmmakers of inaccuracies and of oversimplifying a complex conflict. Regardless of how successful they've been, they've received a tremendous amount of criticism. Others have criticized it. And there has been pretty widespread criticism about this video. Money is something else invisible children have been criticized for. They've been criticizing this issue. Is this the right issue for so many? They were really coming at this man from every angle. Okay, so let's dissect some of these critiques. Oversimplified and sensationalized. It's hard to argue with the fact that it seems like Coney 2012 was engineered to tug on your heartstrings. Right from the start when that sad piano hits, it's like they're priming you for a cry. When you have a video that's manufactured around this emotional narrative, it's easy to get lost in the sauce a little bit. Coney 2012 was accused of being reductive and one-sided, and they got flamed for omitting certain things like the Ugandan government's role in the conflict, for example. Jason responded to this criticism by basically saying, yeah, we did oversimplify it. That's what you gotta do to get numbers. If you want a more in-depth analysis on the conflict, go watch a Dantavia's video. Wow. Thank you, Jason. Subscribe, by the way. Misleading. The presentation in that video uh, gives a picture that is not complete. When you look at it and you listen to what they are saying, it's as if coin is still in Uganda, as if Uganda is still at conflict. And yet, of course, we all know this is not true. This is Amama Mbubazi, the prime minister of Uganda at the time. He's pointing out that Kony 2012 didn't exactly paint an accurate picture of what was really going on. First of all, the video made it seem like Uganda was still in the middle of a war, which was not the case. Secondly, Kony wasn't even in Uganda anymore for like the last six years. White savior. If you search the term white savior on Urban Dictionary, the top result is directly related to invisible children. White savior reverts to Western people trying to fix the problems of struggling nations or people of color without understanding their history, needs, or the region's current state of affairs. Context. Invisible Children aims to hold the solutions of three American filmmakers above the African activists who have lived and worked in the affected communities their whole lives. Talk about white saviors. I gotta admit, for a video that's supposed to be about African children struggling to survive, it sure did heavily feature a white dude. This guy shines a light on the uh, on himself first and foremost and how he and his child are dealing with it, which was really bizarre. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but it was enough for me to see the boy soldier crying because he saw his brother have his neck sliced right in front of him. I don't think there's anything more horrendous than trying to do good but doing the exact opposite. For all of Invisible Children's well-intentioned involvement in Uganda, it might actually have made things worse. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later, and I know I keep saying that, but uh, you know, I'm trying to string you along, okay? It's a tactic for retention. At the end of the day, none of this criticism mattered. They were bringing in tons of money and drumming up tons of awareness to the cause. All Jason had to do was ignore the hate, stay focused, and not run into the middle of the street naked screaming obscenities. Fuck. Okay, maybe he wasn't handling the criticism that well. You might remember that when this video came out, there were a ton of rumors circulating that he was on meth, or if he was schizophrenic, or he was whacking off. That's all fake news. He just had a good old-fashioned mental breakdown brought on by massive amounts of stress and neglecting his health and sleep. The man had been flying around the world doing countless interviews, not sleeping at all, and at the same time, everyone was calling him a stupid piece of shit when all he was trying to do was help people. That's enough to drive anyone at least a little crazy. I think Jason himself said it best. There are very few examples of people who have been publicly shamed and put under that white hot light that don't have some kind of breakdown. He later did an interview with Oprah to explain his side of the story. There were all these other rumors too that you were gay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've heard those rumors. Yeah. <laughs> 
That you were running in the streets nude and yeah. because you were gay. Bro, I love how this man just went through the most traumatic experience of his life and Oprah's just like, so, uh, you gay? But this all begs the question, was it worth it? Was all the bullshit worth it? Well, in short, probably not. And actually, it's possible that Invisible Children made things worse. But Danny, look at all the people marching in the streets for justice. Look at all the donations and support that were pouring in. How can you say that's a bad thing? Well, at the end of the day, 99% of people can't be bothered to get off their fat asses and do anything practical. They change their profile picture on Facebook, they dump a bunch of water on themselves and feel really good and then called it a day. So while it looks like a lot is going on, it's mostly just slacktivism. That's not to say that Invisible Children didn't do anything, because they definitely did. In fact, back in 2006, IC successfully lobbied the Obama administration to send troops to Africa and help Ugandans capture Kony. But unfortunately, no good deed goes unpunished. Ultimately, Invisible Children is calling for a military intervention by the U.S. and others, and that military intervention what's was tried in before. Case? It was tried before, back in 2008, it was called Operation Lightning Thunder, reported well in the New York Times and elsewhere, where the U.S. using military forces went in, and what we, working with the Ugandan militaries, what we saw essentially was Ugandan civilians caught in the crossfire, huge uh, escalation in deaths at that time, a military operation that in fact failed, was never reviewed, never scrutinized, and now a call for essentially young people People to go all out and essentially support yet another attempt at a military intervention. Yeah, military intervention probably wasn't the best move. And even after all that, they still didn't catch Coney. He's still alive and as of 2024 is believed to be hiding out in Sudan. His army is just a shadow of what it once was and he's slowly dying of diabetes. Also, it's been reported that most of the spirits that once possessed his body have abandoned him as well. Except for Hing Su. That mother sucker's a ride or die. Stop, Coney, man, I can't believe it's going down. From my town to your town, they taking kids, turn them into soldier, put a gun in his hand, and his life is over. It's getting so crazy, gotta take it over. We gon' stop Coney, it's 20 over, it's 2012. Ten summers, kidnapped a kid, took him to the jungle.